One's for sorrow, two's for joy. Three's for a girl and four's for a boy. Five's for silver, six for gold. Seven's for a secret never told. Hi, back out again, my son Trav. Hello. Hello. So, we're just doing a little walk down by the river today. I'm hoping the sound works, we had problems last time. Um, it's pretty windy, but sunny. And we've got the fleeces if we need them, but we're okay for now. Um, so today, I thought we'd just have a little chat. I'm gonna, just a bit of an overview about the agricultural revolution which went on at the same time as the Industrial Revolution um, and how it completely changed the countryside and you know, the face of the countryside, the wildlife, what goes on obviously completely changed farming I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened during World War II that also made massive changes and how basically it turned the countryside and the urban cities on their heads from what they've been before. So we're going to push on yeah. and then we'll ah, talk a bit more. There goes my hat. I can't get it. Catch you in a minute. <laughs> Okay, so a bit further on. Yeah. So I was going to talk a little bit about what was the agricultural revolution, which also included the industrial revolution, or it's an offshoot, whatever way you want to look at it. Basically, up to 1700, possibly mid 1700s, farming was very traditional. It's all done by manual labor. So basically humans and animals and was very intensive. All the things that are done automatically today had to be done by hand. Um, and in medieval times, they had a thing called serfdom, which is a whole nother story, but it was a way of farmers being tied to, subsistence farmers being tied to the land, farming small strips. Anyway, going on, um, yeah, they had enclosures, which I'll talk about again. But basically, things start to change. A lot of it's down to the invention of the steam engine, but there's a lot of inventions coming out, um, lots of things changing. So you went from, let's say for example, you ploughed the field with a plough, big old heavy plough and an ox pulling it, and it couldn't plough very deep, to a ploughing machine. And the same with sowing crops, it used to be done by hand, and then they had uh, sewing machines come out and reapers, threshers to uh, separate the seeds from the rest of the wheat, that kind of thing. So everything started changing very quickly. So at the same time, all the big cities were growing industrially. Um, things like the cotton mills. Uh, we were like a major producer. We were also sort of heading towards Victorian times. We had the British Empire. So there was this massive shift. So if you're talking about 1800, they think about 90% of the population was rural, lived in the countryside. And today, it's estimated about 87% of the population are urban. So we live around towns and cities. So yeah, basically everything changed. I'm also gonna have a quick bit of a chat about Dig for Victory and what that was all about and how that also yeah. changed the countryside. Yeah. So what you've got today is very different. Yeah. Anyway, we'll push on. I'll carry on a bit. You okay, Trav? Yes. He's lost his hat twice. I've lost mine once. Not so windy down here now. Catch you in a bit. Okay. Trav's on the phone to Simon. Fireman. No, not Fireman Sam. He's Joker. He's talking to the Joker. Anyway, a bit further. Uh, I'll flick the camera around. So yeah, the river's actually over there. We turned off slightly. Come down that way. Sure. I'll call the ghost sure. house up there. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today. I thought I'd scribble down a few of the inventions. So I thought I'd tell you about some of them. So, seed drill was invented by Jeffro Tull 
1781. Uh, not the band. That was one of the big inventions. Reaper was invented by Cyrus McCormick in 1831. Um, the thresher, which was used to thresh the seeds, was invented by Harram and John Pitts in 1830. And then the combine harvester, or the first known one, was about 1886. I'm imagining it was a steam powered one. And then the first petrol tractor was 1892. And of course, you can imagine, well, you know, tractors changed everything. So, yeah, just a few samples of some of the machinery. So, we shall carry on. Oh, that's Lansing College just up there if you're interested. We shall push on, hey eh, Trav? Yep. Yep. Okay. Oh. Anyway, after that little interlude about the path being shut, yeah. We're walking back up, slightly different way, but still back up the way we came because it's blocked. Anyway, so yeah, all right, Trav. So, I was going to talk a bit about sort of rounding things up a little bit. The difference, so what does all this mean? Everything that's happened, the agricultural revolution from about 17, 20, 30, up until the 1900s, also up to the, the First World War, you know, what actually happened in the countryside. So yeah, the whole upshot was all this uh, industrialization, all this machinery, this agricultural machinery that came in, basically meant they didn't need nearly as many farm laborers and workers in rural areas as they, as they had in the past. And at the same time, these cities were growing, you know, places like Birmingham, Manchester, Coventry, um, and then the, the oldest, not older, but the normal cities like London was always growing um, because of all this industry created by the machinery and we were becoming a global power. So we were exporting and importing and manufacturing. Um, so the upshot was lots of poor people came off the land and emigrated, immigrated, moved to urban areas, you know, in search of a better life as people still do the immigration. Um, didn't necessarily mean they found it. Some of those factories, you know, they had child labour, there was no real health and safety laws. That's a whole video in itself. <laughs> yes, trap. So it wasn't necessarily the Nirvana they thought it would be, but the upshot was all the, you know, the poorer people, the labourers left. So prior to this whole thing happening, what you'd had, and you can watch my series on country estates for a good plug there, um, was they, you'd have a few rich estate owners, uh, then lots of sort of small farms. Sometimes they were under the estate owner and then loads and loads of poor farm laborers. A lot of them crowd, crowded, a lot of them lived in small villages. So over that period, while it was all industrialized from about 1760, 1800 up to about 1900, maybe sometimes even till the first world war, um, people left. Oh, there's loads of people coming. I'll come back to you in just a second. Yeah. Right. Should we try again then? Yeah, no, we'll carry on. That was just, uh, there's loads of kids doing, I presume like Duke of Edinburgh and things like that. They've all got their massive backpacks. They've probably been camping. We're near the South Downs Way. I just mentioned to them about the footpath being shut and they knew, unlike me. Anyway, what was I saying? So yeah, that situation before was the, lots of people. So what's happened now is you've still got a few rich estate owners, which I've made videos about, um, but you then have a number of sort of medium to large farms that don't have nearly as many people needed to work on them. So you'll have the farmer, um, you know, the family, there'll be a few labourers. So what's happened to these poor villages? They've now turned into wealthy villages. Oh, no. Well, it's good for some people. Yeah. So all these villages now are like, you go there, you need lots of money to be able to afford to live in them now. They've, they've literally gone from poor little rural areas to basically where wealthier people live. Um, some lovely houses there, but a lot of us mere mortals can't really afford to live in the countryside. But we can come and visit, so there you go. So right, so that's how it's changed, it's also, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, because I've got one more thing I want to talk about, which is around Dig for Victory, Second World War. But it happened before 
basically we just ploughed up more and more of the land, used more and more of it because of the growing population to feed the population. We also, from about 1702, I'm just sort of coming up with a number, about that uh, era, we stopped being independent on our food and started to rely on imports as well. And now, in the 2020s, we are heavily, I don't know whether, what it is, it's something like 60%, I guess, it's a lot, where we're reliant on imports, so we couldn't feed ourselves anyway. Um, but it just means that loads of land has been ploughed up. We introduced, as well as all the machinery, pesticides, herbicides, fertilisers, all that kind of thing that uh, isn't really agreeable to wildlife. So it killed off a lot of the wildlife. And uh, yeah, I'll talk about hedgerows and all that sort of thing in a minute when I talk a bit more about digging for victory. But we shall push on. Yeah. Okay, we've just sat down on a lovely bench, had our lunch, haven't we, Trav? Mm -hmm. um, so, last bit of my little story about the, how the countryside has changed. Um, I was going to talk about Dig for Victory, which you may well have heard of. I'll stick some posters up there somewhere. Um, apparently they issued 10 million leaflets. Big rest. Cool. Over the period of the war. So it was started by the Ministry of Agriculture in 1940 and it basically encouraged everybody to grow food. Reason being, as I said earlier, by that time, in fact a long time before, we were so reliant on about 60-70% of our food from a overseas and of course with the war u-boats all that kind of thing you might have heard of the food the worry was the food supply would be cut off and we'd starve um so you know i think yeah it's a brilliant idea loads of people started growing food it was all encouraged um 55 percent of households were growing their own vegetables by 1943 yeah. um and literally people digging up gardens whatever there was rationing a whole separate video. An offshoot of that, which is the bit I want to talk about, was called the Ploughing Up campaign. Um, and that's where they encouraged farmers, by payments and just general encouragement, <coughs> to dig up as much of the land as they possibly could to plant uh, vegetables and wheat, all that kind of thing, because they reckon pound for pound it's more productive than meat. Um, they did also encourage more cows and sheep and all that kind of thing. So there was in animals, but what, to cut a long story short, they basically paid farmers to plough every last bit of land. So what that actually ended up doing was where in the past there'd been maybe a farmer had left a little bit of land to go wild and you had wildlife, birds, voles, moles, rabbits, hares, you know, all British wildlife. They basically ploughed up every last bit up to the edge. And also, it really did spell the demise of hedgerows, um, which were teeming with a lot of wildlife. If you go out nowadays, I mean, in a lot of places, you don't see many hedgerows anymore, but I'll talk about that. Um, barbed wire. I mean, I can't remember when it was vented a long time ago, but all the hedgerows were went. So, yeah. and a byproduct was they were using herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, more and more and more. So yeah, the, they did manage to push up the food production by a hell of a lot so that they didn't need to ship so much in. So on that side it worked, but on the downside it basically destroyed or did a lot to destroy it, the countryside in that it destroyed the wildlife. Um, and the loss of hedgerows was terrible. Now, yeah, don't get me wrong, I understand during the war it was necessary, but of course the problem was at the end of the war farmers were making more money by doing that so very little was restored um, so we lost oh, it's windy now. yeah it's got getting really windy hopefully you can still hear me so the upshot is we lost a hell of a lot I think 71% of the land in the UK is now farmed in some form or other so yeah unfortunately we lost a lot of the wildlife there are moves nowadays to incentivize farmers and others to start doing what's called rewilding um, watch my video at NEP if you want to know about some of what's going on on that and I have noticed that there are some farms I go to and there's hedgerows. I think they're starting to put hedgerows back or at least growing them around the barbed wire so that some of the wildlife and the birds and things can survive because in a normal field, intensively monoculture field, 
it's just ploughed over and over and over and over because um, they used to rotate the fields they used to leave them fallow before that and then they didn't need to do that it's getting really windy now so the upshot is it's sort of the countryside's not the way it was back in the old days it's changed a lot for the better i don't think so but hopefully we are starting to realize what we've done and we're changing things back um so that's about it unless there's anything you want to add trav not really not really <laughs> So, yeah, as I say, I'm not a historian, but I just sort of thought I'd talk about it a little bit and how I feel. But it's still lovely out in the countryside, don't get me wrong. It's just been nice to actually see some wildlife. I've only ever seen a rabbit about three or four times, never seen a snake. Um, I know a lot of... I've seen the odd deer where they keep deer, but I know a lot of the wildlife probably runs a mile and me and Trav start coming along. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're quite noisy sometimes. But even so, there isn't as much. I've, I've noticed even from when I was young. Um, yeah. there's not as much wildlife so let's hope things change for the better all right well we'll probably catch you back in the car then yeah for our verdict for our verdict Nothing. see you catch you in a minute goodbye oh. ah. goodbye Okay, back in the car. Um, actually, the breeze was quite nice in the end. When the sun went out, it got a bit chilly, but we were okay. Didn't need the fleeces. Um, yeah, all my moaning about how bad the countryside is now, it's, <laughs> I should temper that and say, it's still <laughs> lovely being out there. It's just a shame there's not an awful lot of wildlife. Saying that, we saw a load of butterflies, didn't we, Trav? Yes, I've got the way back. in my mouth still. You've got your polo mints. <laughs> so, yeah, lovely walk. It's a river aider, I think I mentioned. Hope I can hear a little bit of food for thought about how things have changed yeah. so Go what's on. your your verdict um really good walk really good walk what's your score um 24 24 well yeah i loved it um as a walk but really it wasn't about the walk today but it was just nice having a walk in the talk um but yeah that the river's always nice down there i will temper it by saying it was shut um but that doesn't take away the loveliness of the river um seven out of ten i don't know how to score it but yeah it was more about i hope you've a bit of food for thought about what happened in the countryside and hopefully things like rewilding mm -hmm. will get back to a bit more of wildlife in the countryside all right then so we'll catch you next time yeah goodbye bye <laughs>